Hey everyone, this is Vantage Points, a series about seeking connection during the COVID-19 pandemic. We take time to check in with our friends in and around the coffee supply chain and talk through all the unique challenges we are facing as an industry. Today we talked to Jordan Scherer of Spirit Tea about the importance of self-reflection and using tea as a medium for making more intentional decisions in both our personal and professional lives. And ease into the day and, and breathe a little bit deeper without um, thinking about what's next and what I have to do and growth, 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 and um, trying to make sure that good tea is as in many hands as possible. Um, so I hope that taking a step back and reflecting is, is only going to make us more intentional in all the decisions we make in the future. My, uh, my cousin just got married over Zoom. Uh, they were supposed to have a wedding um, at the beginning of April. And so they decided to do the wedding over Zoom, uh, which was cool. There was like 80 different people in the in the Zoom chat. Um, it felt That's like crazy. the Brady Bunch in a way, That's with like crazy. all the different screens. Yeah. <laughs> and you watched like who was getting emotional and like who's just kind of like in their PJs. Some people were in their suits. Um, it was really Hello. fun to me. <laughs> Did someone what record working? that? Stone. Uh, I think so. I okay, think so, good. Yep. <laughs> like seeing 80 squares would be crazy. It was nuts. It was really crazy. Yeah, I think it's just we're all getting used to this new world here. It's um, so different. Uh, Even just like when you were here, so for reference for them, it was like March 9th through 11th. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, the, and you said like, oh, hair was like empty like the airport was empty in Chicago which is yeah. even crazy to think about an airport that size just being empty totally empty DC was empty the plane was um I think there was like six people on each flight it was um terrifying and at the time I was like wow this seems like it's getting blown out of proportion and of course how mm-hmm. wrong I was um we have a, a colleague of ours, he's on our team, kind of manages a lot of our uh, producer relationships, uh, who lives in Taiwan. And when it all started happening, we were um, in close communication with him, concerned about how um, he was doing over there. And it was really amazing how um, how much under control Taiwan really had the situation. Mm-hmm. And even to this day, I think they only have 330 cases in the whole country. And they're only about 150 miles from China, right across the border from Fujian. Um, and it's just, it's just wild how quickly it's all come about um, and how much of our plans have changed in terms of sourcing this year. Um, but we can definitely talk about that a little later. But, um, yeah, it's interesting too. Not to, I don't want to like jump ahead, but I remember from talking to you when you were here, like the tea harvest is getting ready to start. So for you guys, yep. right, in all your countries. So that's interesting considering, like, I think branching off from coffee, we want to talk about, like, yeah, what does the harvest look like for you? And give us a little bit more detail about, yeah, your sourcing and how you're affected by it, just because people are probably so unfamiliar with that. And it is different than coffee. So. Definitely. Um, well, first of all, um, we only source primarily from regions about 15 degrees above the equator. Um, so th- that includes countries like China, Japan, Taiwan, a little bit in northern Thailand, um, and a little bit in Nepal. And so um, in tea, uh, the reason why we source from those countries and that those latitudes in particular is because when the trees are able to go th- through periods of dormancy and awakening. Um, Tea is an evergreen tree, so the leaves are never gonna fall off. Um, But the new flush, so the chemical compounds that are actually in those first picks um, are some of the most dense and concentrated. So every year, um, a lot of the the harvests um, all across Asia are typically associated with uh, different holidays that they have. So for in China, for example, they have the tomb sweeping holiday, um, which is right around this time. 
and they call it preaching ming teas, um, which are teas or trees that are picked right before that holiday. Um, so it's usually the first growth of the year, um, and it's typically the most valuable harvest of the year, uh, just because you get so many aromatic compounds in them. And then as you sort of make your way northeast into other regions of China, into Taiwan, Japan, um, we start right around mid-March, and then we end right around um, mid-May for the first harvest. Um, so fortunately, we, we still have been able to get a lot of the fresh 2020 samples here, um, which are some of the most stimulating physiologically um, and certainly the most flavorful. Uh, but that's not to say that the other flushes don't also have value. Uh, just that typically those are the most um, sought after. Uh, so usually uh, price points will usually coincide with when the tea is actually harvested. Um, and then each week, uh, the price seems to change a little bit. Are you seeing that be affected by COVID? So in terms of um, China, it's been really interesting because, of course, COVID was uh, started there and they were the first to have a lockdown. And what our producing partners are telling us is that um, although the quarantines are lifted, there is a major shortage of pickers mm -hmm. uh, this year who are from um, typically uh, countries like my, Myanmar. Um, they're usually transient workers. Um, and in addition, as I mentioned earlier, like the first harvests are really some of the most sought after. And um, this time of year, let's take a region like Feng Huang Mountain in Southeast China in Guangdong, famous for Phoenix oolongs like honey orchid, uh, magnolia aroma. Uh, um, usually at this time of year, um, you go up the mountain and um, either A, you have maocha, which are the fresh harvest leaves um, that are not processed, or B, you have the finished tea. And wholesalers are usually lining up all trying to get their hands on those first harvests because again those are typically the most aromatic and what we're hearing is that the mountain is more or less um maybe 10 percent of the amount of wholesalers that were there last year or there this year buying mm -hmm. um so what happens in terms of price point is um you think okay well you have less pickers so you have less yield uh so the price would go up but because there is less demand this year, the prices are actually going down. Um, so it's, um, we're all, I mean, we, we keep saying we're all in this together, but from the, the production side, um, what a lot of the producers are telling us is that this year is just a total fluke, <laughs> kind of an asterisk. Um, it's, there's, um, so many challenges with production, uh, with the lack of, of available hands. Because remember, in, in most of these countries outside of Japan, all these tea, trees are handpicked. Um, and so just to produce, um, let's say 100 kilos of tea will usually take about 1,500 kilos of raw leaf. Um, so... Uh, that's kind of, in terms of, of production and yield, that, that is one of the, the factors. And then, of course, in the export markets, because there's just not much uh, trade happening, the demand is also down. So there's, there's so many factors that are kind of, um, from an economic standpoint, really challenging the market right now. And it's, I think, you know, I often say that at least in coffee, and I think it's very clear with tea as well, that there are so many hands involved. And sometimes we underestimate how many hands, right? And yes. so when it comes to like pickers, like it's when you go to origin or you go to the source, however you want to say that, um, I think that one of the values in that, that experience or for some that pilgrimage is this mind boggling, baffling moment where you're like, I never thought of that person, that one person, because I have not been a part of this, this segment, right? And so when I think about um, milling or exporting a container of coffee, 
in Uganda right now, the things that we have to think through and take of like, we can't have people together. So how long is that going to take with less people? How do we group them and keep them safe? And what tools do we need to give them to keep them safe? So in coffee right now, that's a huge crisis sorting. Mm -hmm. um, and, and partners in Colombia are also just like devastated by that because you work for a whole season for this quality and this passion project. And then you come for those final steps and then you're like, <laughs> yes. I can't, I can't sort. And if it takes too long, how, what will that do to my quality? And it just, it's this ebb and flow, this back and forth of what's, what's the best scenario for right now. Um, and I see that happening for you as well in tea. Absolutely. Um, and one of the things we always talk about, because I feel like we always learn so much from coffee and coffee is so much that it can learn from tea as well. Yeah. is um, tea is, because it's not a globally traded commodity, um, meaning it, it's not bound by the market, price yeah. points are typically determined by the local regions. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, um, most of these teas are consumed in country. Uh, so um, as an importer, we're always kind of working um, to convince uh, some of these producers to actually ship the tea out of the country because they really they really have plenty of demand over there. Yeah. Um, it's it's difficult sometimes to predict kind of where um, how um, the different factors will affect uh, price points, but um, there's certainly a lot of challenges out there right now. Yeah. So you mentioned that like that was how it was like affecting your production. I know you guys also have a storefront. Um, well, how has that affected your like employees and your business that way? I remember we talked a little bit that you and Taylor were coming up with like a worst case scenario plan of like you guys might be doing the packing, but mm -hmm. how, how is that looking for you in Chicago? Yeah, well, it's so funny because Taylor is uh, really, really good at kind of seeing obstacles ahead. And sometimes any business partnership is going to have kind of a yin and yang. And I always thought when he was first talking about COVID and we have to come up with a COVID plan. And this was weeks ago. This was uh, late February. I was like, you're nuts. It's not going to be that bad. Um, and of course now here we are. Uh, well, our businesses, um, first off, um, we are so entrenched in wholesale. And as you know, most of our market is in, specialty coffee and um, with so many of the cafes and roasters and hospitality groups that we work with closing um, we've just seen an enormous um, decrease to our wholesale business um, and online was never really um, a huge focus for us the website and now of course it's become more or less the lifeblood um, so I often, I keep going through exercises of um, if we knew this was coming, what would we have done differently? And certainly one of those things would have been catering more specifically to consumers. Um, we get so immersed in the specialty world of um, working with people in the industry and having these, these dialogues about processing and price points and sourcing. Um, and then you talk to your average consumer about um, a very specific style of tea and of course you lose them almost right away. And so it's never really been a focus to do retail. Um, and it's definitely been a, a learning lesson for us. Um, in terms of our production team, we had originally three people on our staff and now we have just one. Uh, both in terms of safety and keeping the space, um, making sure the space is, is clean and um, consistent with FDA standards. Um, and so it's pretty bare bones right now. Um, but we have seen a pretty good uptick in our online sales. And um, it's been really in inspiring to see. But... Um, it's so disorienting because it's just like normally when sales are slower, 
uh, you know, we turn to our industry and the places that we can um, normally tap into uh, to, to move tea. And of course, we don't have that right now. So um, the marketing team has just done a, a really, really stellar job. Um, we've, we've tried all sorts of different approaches. And the main thing is, is that we're, we're you know, there's a lot of noise out there. We, we know that a lot of people are investing in advertising and trying to incentivize purchases, but how can we make meaningful content uh, that are, that's really going to put people at ease, yeah. um, feel connected to our mission and our, our ethos uh, without really asking um, for the commercial side of it. Yeah. Um, so um, we've, we've done a lot of different things from uh, making these little two-bit animations featuring all the company's uh, cats and dogs around teas. Um, we've got a really skilled graphic designer on the team that um, <laughs> it's just been, been great. Um, and then the other, the other part has just been uh, the website itself, which we had just launched maybe back in October. Um, and we did, we designed it all in house. We didn't really pay a elite e-commerce team to make it. And it's been really interesting to see how people are interacting with the website. Lots of, some pros and definitely some cons. A um, lot of things to think about. Um, and I'm also realizing, at least personally, that a lot of my understanding of the internet marketing world is very dated. Maybe 10 years ago, I thought, I know how this all works. Let's tap into the blog <laughs> network. Let's do... Uh, yeah. You know, backlinks and all this, all this stuff that turns out is completely irrelevant. And I, I've, um, it's definitely been humbling because we're constantly trying to fine tune our craft. And again, we've been, we've been talking to an audience of industry people for so long. Does that same message really translate to the consumer? Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, it's hard to, to really speak to because um, there's just so much unknowns. You're looking at the traffic coming in and you're, you're looking at how many conversions there are and what is a realistic ratio. It's a whole new world for us. Um, we are just a group of people that are really passionate about tea. And you know, along the way, we've developed some business uh, acumen and know-how. Um, but the world of internet marketing is... Uh, often just very intimidating because yeah. there's it's always changing I would say oh yeah I would say that sentiment we talked to Evan at Passenger earlier and he had the same like you I think he uses the same world humble humble too he was like yeah it's very humbling to like realize like these weaknesses in this time and we have the same exact thing at ceremony it's the same exact thing like e-commerce is where we were lacking. Our website was not set up to purchase some of the things that people could get from us. And while you were talking, I started thinking because for tea and coffee, the specialty sector especially, we've had trouble communicating with the consumer. Like you were saying before, like you start talking about a specialty oolong and people are like, okay, sure. So I wonder if the silver lining of this whole thing is all of a sudden we figure out how to capture the consumer's attention and like bring them in. And yeah, like update all of our marketing. It's very interesting, Absolutely. actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I think so too. I mean, maybe there is a lot of opportunity there. If people can really start developing this ritual at home, um, that would be would be great. I mean, we'd maybe they'd finally connect in a way that would be exciting. I, have you div dived into, um, uh, I was just poking around in the whole Google Analytics thing. And what you can do is you can look at these keyword generators. And um, so for example, I would type in phrases like, what is T and then see what Google generates for what people search. And um, to be honest, I was pretty, uh, it was pretty depressing to see what people are actually yeah, no. searching about T. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's very utilitarian and health driven. And I've been, we've been trying to think about what type of blog posts we can make because we've been generating content like crazy. 
And it's just like, I don't really want to talk about how oolong tea can help you lose weight. And I don't really want to talk about, you know, we've never positioned ourselves as a, as a health oriented um, brand. Mm -hmm. Tea is medicinal, spiritually, physically. Um, it's been known for ages. It's the second oldest beverage in the world um, behind beer, by the way. But <laughs> it's just not what we talk about. We, we've worked right. for, Taylor and I have both worked for multiple tea companies that have had that focus. And we always felt sort of uncomfortable talking to those things because we aren't nutritionists and we're not doctors. And it's not what makes us passionate about tea. Um, but do you want that traffic? Do you not want that traffic? Is that your consumer? Do you want to talk to those people? It's been kind of a, a little bit of an existential um, question for us. I think the answer is still resolutely no, but <laughs> it doesn't hurt to know where the consumer is and what steps can we take to try and at least meet them part of the way. And a challenge. It's tough. You know, to it really like is. Knowing what you're challenging within the within this new target. You know, so many of us with this crisis and with this challenge, we have new customers right now. Our, our communication strategies are targeted at completely new audiences. Yep. And we have to restructure that. And using a tool like Google Analytics is super helpful in realizing those blind areas that we have for ourselves about that new audience. And it's a testimony to um, everyone's resiliency and their agility to say, oh, one, I have a new audience and I have to meet them where they are in this understanding. But two, reclaiming where you are, reclaiming where like, no, this affirms that I am in this for this reason. I want people to know that tea is this to us and that's what makes us different. But now we know where you are and how we have to talk to you. Um, exactly. I think it's such a um, an interesting pause that we're not often given, and I'm not going to claim that we're blessed by this crisis, but I, but um, it's it's an interesting output of what we're all experiencing, and um, it's cool to see how we're all kind of fighting to get on the other side of this, and I hope that um, this series of videos can maybe give insight like even you saying have you ever looked at google analytics <laughs> like that might be really beneficial for someone else to say fuck like i i i have a new audience what how do i even start and and that that's a step for a lot of people to say i have to have a completely new communication strategy um, definitely yeah absolutely yeah. And, and to expand on that too, it's like, what, who can we, who has gone down this road before, either mm -hmm. in our industry or ancillary to our industry that might offer some clues? Um, I remember just going back, it, it's similar to the internet um, knowledge that I had had in 2010, which again is very outdated, but you go back to like, intro level marketing classes where you talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs yeah. and um, how that affects the things that people consume. Um, and so a lot of these traditions in tea going back many, many hundreds of years has been very esoteric. It's a medium for inner reflection or meditation or mindfulness. Um, and when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's self-actualization, the very right. tippy top, like <laughs> the, uh, the fats and sugars in the, uh, in the nutritional period. How many people actually want that? And especially in times like this, when people are just trying to survive and they have so many worries and stresses and um, where the very basic levels of shelter and food are now focused, you know, do people really want to sit back and and come, come back in, look inward. Um, or even in the social world, a lot of us are going onto Instagram to fulfill that social need. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, normally even in, in coffee, you're talking about, well, coffee is an opportunity to come together. 
and have a great conversation over coffee. And uh, it's about community and being social. And when we're all just isolated in our little pods, it's, <laughs> it's tough. It's really, really tough. Yeah. I feel like a strength for you guys has always been the way you talk about the spirituality of tea. And I wonder if that can, I mean, like you said, it's the top to be top of the hierarchy, but I wonder in a time like this, especially like when you were here doing a training with us, I remember you guys talking about how people think about the spirits within the tree and like how old the tree is. And you can probably talk about that better than I can, but that always stuck with me. And I was just like, oh, there's, there's more just like with coffee and with tea, there's so many people behind it, but also when you have agriculture in these sourcing countries, the way they think about the plant and the product is so different. And like, yeah, the generations behind it and what it means. And even when you're talking about the harvest and how it's all ceremonial too around holidays, like to me, that's like stunning. And it makes me feel connected in another way. Like when I drink this, I'm connected to so much more, but definitely, who knows if that's something you can play on to connect with people. Yeah. Well, it's funny you mentioned that um, I have some of the 2020 harvest here from some dear friends. And this time, typically, uh, I'm in sourcing countries. I'm in China and Taiwan. And um, and it's been interesting to drink it and reflect. I was just telling Taylor yesterday, I have a new Phoenix Oolong that was harvested about two weeks ago in my cabinet behind me. And I, I was messaging him yesterday. I was like, wow, the, the chi or the energy in this tea, it feels like lightning in my legs. I'm yeah. so alert, but it's not caffeine per se. It's more, um, and again, very esoteric, but it's like the message of the plant is, is transmitted. Um, and sometimes it's like, it also comes back to the blogging thing because it's like, I, it's much easier to write about things that you relate to with tea or coffee. Um, so for me, it's always been uh, the energy of it. The history of it has always been fascinating for me. Um, tea touches so much of historical anecdotes. Um, whereas things like processing, interesting, but not personally. Like It's not something that creates a lot of enthusiasm for me. Um, so to be to be really frank too um i do i don't really manage much of our our marketing efforts in fact it's probably a blessing that they don't let me touch the instagram <laughs> um <laughs> i'm constantly reminded of that when i post on my own personal instagram and i get like eight likes and i'm like oh okay this is why they don't <laughs> let me touch this like <laughs> but um yeah it's a uh, it's although the first week or two of of covid and and quarantine was really really scary um little by little i'm seeing some some gaps in the clouds and lots of opportunity to re- reflect on why did we start this and um in all the um success that we've been really fortunate to have over the last 5 years um it's easy to lose perspective of um, why we're doing this Mm -hmm. and I found that this has just been a really great opportunity to just in the morning wake up sit make a cup of tea watch the way it affects me and my body and my thoughts um, and ease into the day and and breathe a little bit deeper without um, thinking about what's next and what I have to do and growth, 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 and um, trying to make sure that good tea is as in many hands as possible. Um, So I hope that taking a step back and reflecting is is only going to make us more intentional in all the decisions we make in the future. it's anyone's guess as to what the landscape is going to look like in terms of wholesale. Um, We hope that many of our partners come out of this intact. Um, A a good friend, do you know um, Jamie Isitz from Merit Coffee by chance? I know Merit, but I don't know Jamie personally. They're in Texas, right? 
Yep. Yeah. Um, she's a good friend, and, and she was saying, we were talking the other day, and um, she's like, I just want you to know that even if, let's say, spirit doesn't make it or if spirit falls apart, oh God. Um, <laughs> you are so much more than what you've built. Mm -hmm. And we identify so much with uh, what we're passionate about. And it was actually really um, – and there was something in that sentence that really just made me feel like, I don't know. It's, we are not all, we are not what we produce entirely. And it's been a great, um, crazy journey because so much of our culture really tries to, um, impart that, that, whatever you produce is who you are. Yeah. Our value and is certainly. how hard we work. Yeah. Exactly. Is hustle? Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Like you too can have the American dream and um, it's <laughs> just been, it's, it's like, I, I'm having such a hard time verbalizing it because it's still kind of disrupting my mind because for, mm -hmm. you know, how long have we been on this track? Um, yeah. How long have we accepted this as like a, a unchangeable truth in the Western world. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so it's, it's, I'm 99.9% .9 sure we'll make it through it. But <laughs> that 0 0.01 is like, well, even if we did daunting, <laughs> how, you know, what would we walk away from this to feel yeah like or remember that we have self-worth beyond what we make and what we produce and it's not entirely the story of who we are even though it it feels so real all the time mm -hmm. yeah and you know one of the questions we're asking everyone is how are you thriving through this time and it's a hard question to answer during a crisis but we want people to reflect we mm -hmm. we want to challenge the fact that um I feel like you answered a lot of that question that this is such a great time of reflection. It's a great time to be challenged um, and navigate that challenge and navigate who am I communicating to now? This message, like the why I'm in this, the, the thing that surpasses the product, but the why, why me, you know, why this? Um, so I think that's, I think that's what we're all navigating behind, behind that question, like that reflection. Um, and you also answered this other question of, you know, every single person in leadership in a business has to show up for a lot of people, um, their own staff, their own producers on either side of wherever they are in this chain. And, you know, you, you've kind of answered that question and like, how, how do I have to show up for my team? But you also answered the question of how someone showed up for you and saying who you are to them. You know, that, that, that moment of, of her saying like, this is how I see you in connection to who we are in this, in this industry of supply chains. You know, we're, we're very intentionally doing this series of branching off because, you know, we're not necessarily the coffee industry, we're, we're this hospitality industry and food comes into play, sugar comes into play, spices come into play, and obviously tea. Um, and we have such a respect for those other industries and they feel like our family. Um, so it's so important for us to say, we know, we acknowledge that our, our little world of crisis is affecting your little world of crisis. Um, so we want people to honestly and boldly claim and, and take up space and say like, this is what I need from you. So is there any way that you want to elaborate on that even more? Just like in a very tangible, like this is my point, we work in tea, y'all are coffee, this is what we need from you. Oh. Yeah, um, well, it's funny because on my list for the last couple of weeks, because so much of the strength that I bring um, to our company is in relationships and in people that we've worked with and we're always traveling um, and trying to there's so much of what we've had to do over the last five years has been physically having to convince people why they should carry traditional tea at a coffee shop 
mm-hmm. in a world where um, you know it was Earl Grey and Jasmine and Roybus, and it never changed ever. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I, from a from the community standpoint, um, I keep looking back and and saying, at first it was. Um, how can I leverage our relationships to help us? And I, I realized that that was the wrong question um, because everyone is struggling right now. And <laughs> it's been on my list for you now three weeks to try and encourage, like I've been considering doing guest blog posts on other on cafes' websites or roasters' websites. But for some reason, I can't do it. I can't actually send those emails. And it feels like a strange juxtaposition for me because of everything I should be leaning into, it's that. Um, but then why am I not doing it? it? Because I realize that it's better if I can just check in with people and see how they're managing this experience, like this conversation we're having. Um, it's like there isn't an actual utility to that. I'm not getting anything from them and they're not really getting anything from me from a commercial standpoint, but just learning from, it's like the difference between knowledge and wisdom. It, it feels like um, we're all able to to learn something that, that might actually help in the future in the least utilitarian way possible. Um, so I think it's just a community. It's just having these ongoing conversations. Uh, practically speaking, it would be great to try and like, once we understand, you know, speak to their customers, whether it's through a blog post or um, a social media shout out and say like, you know, here's a switch here. We're going to talk about tea and here's why yeah. we designed the menu that we designed. And, but it still feels like I'm getting something from them and it just doesn't, the, the tough part has been, it doesn't feel so, um, I don't know. There's just something, it's almost like so much of capitalism has been disrupted in this experience and Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways for a very positive characteristic. Um, So it's just mostly in terms of the community, it's just checking in kind of, I've been sending tea like crazy. Taylor and I have both been, we actually purchased tea from the website and send it to all our friends across the country. And whether or not, you know, it's not really about, them plugging it on social media although that's great if they can it's more just like when you open your cabinet let's just remember about what tea can be um and uh there's so so much less of like what can i get from this um relationship and more just like it's something where something can be put in um and then the second question is like how do we show up for our team right now and and the um we've learned so many lessons and and unfortunately we did have to um let go of some team members uh within the first two weeks of this situation and um it's for one reminding um all of our team members of why we're here and that we um everyone that's currently a part of our team is essential and and really really important and um it's not super formalized but just constantly checking in and making sure that people are doing okay on our team and um taylor manages most of the marketing side and i've been managing our production team um, there is a lot of anxiety out there right now and, and our small team of now eight people is no different. Um, and, uh, our expectations in terms of work are very loose. Um, but we've tried to really mobilize everyone to try and make an effort on the external stuff. Um, so some team members are now on the uh, searching for uh, voices outside of our industry community that might be influential. Mm -hmm. I hate the word influencer, but I'll say influential. Um, Or um, 
trying to create meaningful content that really matters to yeah. us, uh, whether it's blog posts or um, small short videos about something new and exciting or that we're excited about. And uh, I would also say going to the external, it's um, so much of social media, for example, gets caught up in engagement and likes and immediate validation, but um, trying to encourage the marketing team to really focus more on our meaningful content. Mm -hmm. um, things that are just not, not too commercial, uh, which is tough because the inclination right now, there is a sense of like, you know, an enormous market has been essentially taken away in the last two weeks. And though there is a sense of, we need this, um, how can we try and be calm or be that medium to make people calm in the midst yeah. of that um, circles back to your product sense. right yeah. it circles back to how you view the way that you love your product and the reason why you love it and i think you touched on um you know i'm constantly enamored with people's ability to be gracious to one another through this process and to be so giving um and your gift, you and Taylor's gift to people that you cherish, say this is this is a tool for you to have for reflection and we want you to use it to love yourself and know that we love you. And I think that sharing that and and seeing how other people like um almost uh, so many front of houses are just saying we want to donate, we want to give to people who are in crisis. We want them to have this moment of of feeling loved and reflecting on on how people care about them. And I just think that circling that through into meaningful content is only reestablishing what why you're in it anyway, um, and just making sure that we're creating content that reinforces those those feelings and those sentiments I think is really important and a challenge but it's it's necessary for sure exactly yeah. exactly um, you pretty much nailed it it's something we we hope you know tea can be so much it's it's such a vehicle um, for many different outlets and in a lot of ways, it's almost like a stem cell in the sense that um, where you want it to go when you drink it is where it goes. Um, it's a very, very magical drink. Um, and if we can encourage that ritual, um, great. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And I used to be really attached to that, that kind of outcome. And... Uh, I remember Taylor and I very early on, we used to teach tea classes at the Chicago Botanic Gardens. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would always, it was really up to us what the curriculum would be. So we did um, tea 101, tea and health, tea and mm -hmm. meditation, um, the history of tea. Uh, and depending on the subject matter, we would determine who would teach that class. And, uh, I'll never forget. So Taylor did tea in history and tea 101 and I did tea in meditation and tea in health, which trust me was a struggle based on our last <laughs> comment. But the program director really encouraged us to do that because they thought it would drive some attendance. So the tea and meditation one was really hard because um, although I have a mindfulness practice in my life, I realized how... Um, you know, I really wanted people to walk away with this feeling of calm or uh, presence. And I was so attached to the outcome. Mm. And um, when I looked around the room and I would read my notes and I would encourage people to watch the way the tea warms you, watch how far in your body you can feel it. And I look around the room and see a lot of people just kind of aghast. they like, I have no idea what this guy's talking about. Um, and uh, one of the lessons we've learned is um, what can we do by not doing anything? Mm -hmm. And how 
much of our lives are we just attached to an outcome or trying to get a sense of control. Um, and whether it's internally or externally, we can put out the message or put out the content or have a conversation with one of our team members without trying to um, control the outcome of it. Mm -hmm. Again, just another funny paradox of the, the world we're living in. Um, and the last thing I'll say about that is um, T, for what it's worth, has always been full of funny paradoxes um, and how it interacts with the American fabric. You know, like for example, bigger is always better in America, whereas in tea we always drink from these little tiny cups. Um, or um, in a culture that really is encouraging production, encouraging you to speed up and do more and more and more, tea is really encouraging you to slow down. And um, those paradoxes ideally become things that um, you make one small shift and the whole context of your world can change. Um, but being that it is such a inner exploration, um, we hope that tea can be the medium for that, but um, what it means to, to people is mostly up to them. <laughs> we hope the, the message resonates, but um, how, we can't entirely control that outcome. So it's, it's fun to play around with uh, all of these different forces and see how they, they play into our world. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful. I want to <laughs> circle back to, I guess, my point of view as like a coffee buyer. And like earlier we were mentioning, you were saying we talk about some of your, like how your purchasing decisions have been affected. And so I'd be interested to hear about that too, especially like in coffee standpoint, as well as it's seasonal. So it's like you, you probably forecasted so much need and now you're going to have a lot of backup and now people you're committing to in the new harvest. So if you could, before we let you go, maybe speak a little yeah, on that. That's a great question. Um, this has been kind of a tricky one because uh, we are a tea importer and we are so excited by the new harvest. We say we are a seasonal tea company. And that means the, har the teas that we actually purchase are gonna change throughout the year according to the peaks of harvest. Um, so uh, this year we had had a couple of teas in the past. Um, as I mentioned earlier, like the demand is always really, really high at origin internally within the country. And teas, um, in the process, we have always said that we will make buying decisions collectively, uh, which can be very challenging because uh, sometimes you're there and you're like, wow, I know there's only 50 kilos of this. This is amazing. I know our market. We've never had anything like this. Mm -hmm. um, and by the time I get home and we sample it all together, which might be three to four weeks from now, it's probably going to be gone. Um, so we have three different buyers. I do Eastern China, Taiwan, and Thailand. Taylor does Western China and Nepal. And then Nicole does Japan and Korea. And um, so in the past, um, I'll, I'll speak to Taylor's region. Uh, there is... You, you all are both familiar with the tea called Silver Needles. And um, there's one producer every single year. She's in Dahong, which is right on the border of Myanmar. Usually Silver Needles are coming from uh, different regions of Yunnan. Um, so it's unusual to come from Dahong. And every year her tea just smokes the table. Um, it's got almost this like tomato vine, which I know is not a positive character in <laughs> coffee, but for this tea, it is really mind blowing. Um, and so this year we said we were going to buy, uh, I think it was 250 kilos, which is enough for the entire year for us for that category. Um, and all under the assumption that demand was going to carry on in the way that it was. Um, and that, by the way, is a very expensive purchase. Um, it's uh, per kilo, it's almost right around $100 a kilo. Um, and it's 
um, we signed a contract, we put down a deposit, and then uh, right when this all started, we have, it's actually been my field to look at these Excel charts of cash flow and worst case scenario, what if sales go here and what if wholesale goes here and what does that mean from ending cash flow from a week to week basis? Now, how are we gonna, <laughs> um, we were committed to this, we signed a contract for this T. Um, now what can we do with worst case scenario? And um, for example, with that T, the contract was uh, the first part would ship in mid-May and then we would have to buy all of the lot. She would hold basically ship like 60, 70 kilos at a time. And we would have to buy the rest of it by the end of June, which would be um, each one, each wire would be somewhere around 7,000, um, six, seven times. <laughs> and um, Kevin, who manages a lot of our relationships in Taiwan, we've been really close com communication with him. Um, having him there is really important because he knows how to navigate those conversations a little better than we would. Um, so where it stands right now, um, like most of the small businesses in the U.S. were awaiting to see if these utopian loans that the government says are really easy to get are going to happen. <laughs> if they happen, then we're still able to get these the the lots that we had committed to. Um, fortunately, in uh, most of China, there's this concept in business uh, called guangxi, uh, which is essentially the the hallmark of a great relationship. And so, typically, what that means, um, because these lots are limited and they have long-standing customers domestically that have gone back decades. Um, usually what this means is year after year, let's take someone like Eric Chan, who's one of my favorite producers in Southeast China. Um, he gives me access to some of the, the best stuff that he's producing. Or if we have a comment about processing, he'll make some adjustments so it makes more sense to our market. Um, and in the context of committed buying relationships, um, T is very much a cash in hand business, uh, there aren't terms. I think out of all the producers we work with, which is around 40 to 50 producers a year, maybe two give us terms. Um, wow. So with years of cooperation, um, we used to go over there and we'd be like, okay, yeah, we work with Eric, but maybe there's something else better out here. Let's spend the whole day looking for a new farm. And by the time you get done, you go, wow, I'm more confused than where I started. Um, and so we've now leaned more and more into our relationships. Um, these are people that I consider dear friends as much as I do business partnerships. Um, we're constantly communicating through the messaging apps. And um, fortunately, they are also, despite the quarantine being lifted, they're very much affected by the situation in the same way we are. Mm -hmm. and we're able to speak really honestly and say, here's where we're at. I wish I could, I had planned on buying X amount of this tea. And, um, is there any possible way you would be willing to hold X amount of kilos until this date, just to see if, if this yeah. funding comes through? Um, and fortunately, uh, the answer has been yes. So I've even considered, and I've done this in the past, much to my own detriment, is I will just buy it on my credit card. I don't want the business to be affected by it. And when times are better, maybe I'll be paid back for it. But it really is a true passion for us. And like just going back to um, just sending people tea and mm -hmm. it's... I guess I would call it pride. Um, I just really, really care about this. And um, every year it tends to get better. Our sourcing tends to get better and better. And it's less chasing these unicorns around China and more just like, 
this is a really solid relationship and this this producer keeps getting better and better and you keep getting access to better and better stuff and yes cost typically increases with it but that's okay because this isn't about just margin this is about like revealing a world that is totally um uh, it's almost beyond words um it's like uh, i'm trying not to go on too many tangents because it <laughs> taps into so many parts of my brain but um tldr long story short um we're doing everything we can to purchase this amount of tea that we had already committed to, even if it takes us a little longer to sell it. Um, tea has quite a long shelf life. And actually, I just got done yesterday. We're releasing a new series of teas. Um, it's uh, one of the first farms Taylor and I visited in South Central Taiwan. Um, this producer hand makes white tea. Mm -hmm. um, and she ages them. So we have a 2015, 2016, and 2017 harvest uh, that we're going to be releasing. And uh, I say all that to say the old, the old saying goes, after one year, you drink tea. After three years, you have a medicine. And after five years, you have a treasure. Mm. So many of the teas, I would say, outside of greens um, are going to continue to improve with age. So even if something is harvested in 2019, which right now, out of all of our teas, we only have one from 2020, which normally we would have, at the very least, we'd have samples of this time of year. We wouldn't really start actually getting them until May or June. Um, they're going to continue to get better, and they're going to continue to to taste great. And it's one, one really lucky thing we have in tea. Um, and we had also just sourced a bunch of stuff um, has been kind of weird because normally we won't release a tea until at least its predecessor within that category had sold out and uh now it's we're we've probably never had as much variety as we have now on the website <laughs> um we always want to keep things tight and curated but now it's more about like let's just get everything out there and everything released so um it will, uh, even if it takes a little bit longer, um, most of these producers are putting aside the volume that we required and committed to. And um, that is really a testament to the, to the, to the relationships we've built together. And um, yeah, it's, it's uh we're very lucky i think to have that now and to both in the external world and going to these gardens and shaking hands and having dinner together and learning about their families and um in the domestic world in the u.s doing the same thing with our, our wholesale partners um is just what all we can really lean into now it's it's all about that that community and that relationship. Guangxi. Guangxi. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> that's, that's been the relationship. A, it's been such a beautiful and insightful and like moving conversation, I think. So thank yeah. you. It goes both ways. Uh, I just, it's been crazy these last few weeks. And um, finally, I feel like we're all getting some space to plot everything ahead um, so uh, really thank you guys for thinking of us um, this has been really inspiring and I I know we'll all get through this and I, I know it will will come out different than we started but um, hopefully more intentional and, and refined mm -hmm.